The atom is not a solid pellet of matter. Instead, it's uh, quite like a solar system. It has a central nucleus and then electrons revolving in orbits about the nucleus. And like the solar system, it's almost entirely empty space. A moment ago, we analyzed water. We found that it was made of two substances, hydrogen and oxygen. This represents the hydrogen atom, the simplest of them all. It has just one electron revolving about its nucleus. The oxygen atom is considerably more complex. There are eight electrons revolving about its nucleus, which itself is more complex. All of the substances in the material universe, all of the millions of different kinds of things, living and non-living, are made of just a little over a hundred of these building blocks of different configurations. Hydrogen, we said, had one electron revolving about the nucleus. Well, if there were two, it wouldn't be hydrogen, but helium. Three, it wouldn't be a gas at all, but instead would be lithium, a silvery white metal. And so we see that these building blocks, which the Creator has made, form all of the material substance of the universe. But in addition, they are also the source of every bit of power in the universe. All of us are familiar with chemical energy. When we light a match, it burns because chemical energy is liberated. Our civilization has been built upon chemical energy. But even with chemical energy, the atom is the ultimate source of power. Only with chemical energy, it is the electron, the outer part of the atom, that are involved. With atomic or nuclear energy, however, it's the nucleus, the very heart of the atom. Until recently, chemical energy is all that we've known. But on that fateful morning of July 16, 1945, a new age was ushered in as man released nuclear energy for the first time. A source of power millions of times greater than anything we'd known before. Let's see if we can illustrate the difference between chemical energy and nuclear energy. A firecracker is chemical energy. When that firecracker went off, it made quite a fuss, didn't it? That was chemical energy. And you know, it's a good thing it was. If it were possible for us to release the total nuclear energy in the same firecracker, it would equal 10 million sticks of dynamite. That's the difference between chemical energy and nuclear energy. Now, how is nuclear energy released? Well, one way is to split the nucleus in two. Actually, break it in half. When this is accomplished, some very strange and wonderful things happen. In the first place, the two halves weighed together will weigh less than the whole did before. Some of the mass has disappeared in a burst of energy. You remember our formula, E equals mc squared? The equivalence of mass and energy. To split an atom, we must fire a projectile of the right size and velocity and strike the atom in just the right place. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Actually, it's far from simple. Remember, no one has ever seen an atom. And the target is even smaller. And the atomic projectile is still smaller. To meet the requirements of this exacting task, giant instruments such as the cyclotron have been built, designed to fire a torrent of subatomic particles at the nucleus of the atom. In this model of the cyclotron, steel balls represent atomic particles which are guided in a circular path by a strong magnetic field. Under the influence of electrical forces, the stream of atomic particles spiral out faster and faster until they hit the target at the periphery. But now from the model to the instrument itself, 
the famous 60-inch medical cyclotron at the University of California. The material to be bombarded is coated on a plate and then carefully mounted in the target assembly. This target is then fixed to the cyclotron in such a way that the beam of high energy particles will strike it. In the control room behind a protective barrier, the operator puts the cyclotron into operation. Radiation absorbing lead bolts provide safe temporary storage for the irradiated target as they await their use in the laboratories of medical research. Probing still further into the mysteries of the atom is the 184-inch cyclotron, also at the Radiation Laboratory of the University of California. This great 4,000-ton instrument spans 56 feet and towers 33 feet above its foundation and accelerates particles to far greater energies than its 60-inch companion. We are now within the very heart of the 184-inch cyclotron, inside the tank, between the pole pieces of the great 4,000-ton magnet. During operation, this area is a vacuum traversed by a spiraling torrent of atomic particles, accelerated to velocities approaching the speed of light. In the cyclotron and other accelerators, such as the synchrotron and the bevatron and the linear accelerator, atomic energy can be released but only in small quantities. These are essentially research tools designed to give us more knowledge of the structure of the atom. Release of atomic energy on a large scale became possible when a method of sustaining a chain of atomic splits in an isotope of uranium was discovered. The production of the first atomic bomb was a frantic race against time. The urgency of war necessitated a whole generation of time being compressed into a hectic five years. And it was at a cost of $2,000 million. At the peak of the activity, almost a half a million persons pooled their efforts under the tightest of wartime censorship. The success of the gigantic undertaking was dramatically demonstrated that morning at Alamogordo when the first white-hot nuclear fires this side of the sun lit the New Mexico hill three weeks after the first experimental blast. An atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. And then, three days later, another on Nagasaki. These are pictures of that actual blast that destroyed the city of Nagasaki. Two bombs have utterly destroyed two cities, snuffed out the lives of 150,000 human beings, and ended a war. But still, there were many questions concerning the atomic bomb that remained unanswered. Monstrous scale tests in the Marshall Islands were planned to provide the answers. Into Bikini Lagoon came a fleet of 90 target vessels, led by the venerable old battleship Nevada, painted a gaudy red as bullseye for the target array. Ashore, steel towers were erected to house especially designed scientific instruments and cameras of all types and sizes. Doors of reinforced concrete and lead protected film from the effects of radioactivity. Flying boats joined the huge fleet of photographic aircraft. This was the most photographed event in history. 